Hello and welcome to episode two of New Nordic Way Podcasts. So today we're going to talk about the New Nordic Way, a community-based movement for greater collaboration between creative and entrepreneurial talents. And I'm very, very pleased to have our new guest, Mirka, join us. And I'll let you kind of do your own introduction. So Mirka, who are you and what do you do? <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. It's good to be here chatting with you. Um, yeah, so I'm... Uh, a community builder, I would say. Um, I have a very kind of multidisciplinary uh, background, so I, I've done a lot of different things. But I think that at some point, I maybe a few re years back, realized that the, the red thread between all of these things that I do is a focus on community building. So um, so that's what I, I'm doing right now. And um, I'm focusing on, and what I'm doing with New Nordic Way as well is helping to bring to build this community of creatives and entrepreneurs. But um, yeah, my background is, like I said, very diverse, but I have, uh, I'm originally from Montreal, Canada. So I'm a French Canadian, which is why my last name <laughs> is what it is. And um, I um, did a lot of sports when I was in high school at cheerleading and then uh, started to get really interested in yoga when I was quite young. My mother introduced me and and then I was spending a lot of time at the gym and really got into fitness. So I uh, kind of took that path early on, but continued to do my studies and uh, did a commerce degree, so a business degree. And then took a quite a left th turn and moved into art history and studied uh, art history. And what I loved about that was to understand, you know, how movements affect us and how uh, like society, people and art, how how powerful art is and creation is so that really was a, a huge um, and meaningful experience for me to study that but still um, being who I am having kind of a business mind early on I realized that maybe I want to return to business and then I decided I would move to Finland to get like the European experience and uh, move to Finland in 2014 studied um, business at Aalto and uh, then got into entrepreneurship from there on. Okay, very cool. And I'm glad you could see both sides of the world in terms of kind of North America and we like to say the Nordics in this kind of conversation. Yeah. And also in addition to that, have a very kind of good cultural uh, background and understanding mm. as well as kind of not afraid to kind of explore things in terms of more physical activity. So yeah, this is a kind of cool branch to bring um, into our another topic right here is like, when we're kind of brought up in the school system and we're a bit younger, it's super easy to kind of find these communities where they're just kind of like end up better feet. However, it's kind of like when we, you know, enter this kind of after school, 25, you know, before becoming full-fledged parents and stuff, uh, we have a lot of personal responsibility to either create one or then to kind of like be a part of uh, collaborating and making one. So what could you speak about kind of making these more knowledge-based communities, meaning like a entrepreneurial community or a creative community that's a little bit further away from just rock climbing or ice skating and stuff like that. Yeah, that's super interesting. And it and it's true that when we're younger, we're kind of pushed into different groups and, and communities like school and class is one and then sports teams and, and those kind of come easily at first. But then when we are thrown into the real world, so to say, then we're suddenly we find ourselves alone. And I think a lot of people find that really daunting and, and kind of lonely. I think this is a real, real experience that many people have. But we tend to look for community around us. People continue in different sports on a more casual level, sometimes on a more serious level. But um, when we talk about knowledge based communities or even working communities, I think this is becoming something we're realizing only now that is important. Um, artists have known this for a long time. So when you think about uh, creatives and artists, they know that to make something meaningful, you need to work with other people. So again, if you're in that kind of field of work, it's a lot easier to, to have a knowledge sharing community because 
uh, you can't learn everything about uh, a creation creative process on your own and you won't have all the skills either to do everything on your own so you kind of have to get into communities when you're a creative let's let's pause it there for a second yeah, this, this is an interesting concept that i think there's a misconception that created creativity is kind of lonely work that your best ideas come when you're kind of in isolation or by yourself or maybe even actually the creative process because when you think of a painter you're thinking of them with their easel on a kind of a corner of their room with the, an album in the background and then you know kind of a smock and smear and stuff around, you know, and then something yeah, yeah. great is born. But uh, how could you maybe kind of like bring it into how they might better use community to leverage their skills? Yeah, definitely. So so there's there's the problematic, or I don't know if it's a problem, but for creatives, like if we, we talk about creatives, of course, we both know that, that it's a larger category of people. But if we talk specifically about artists, they have a tendency to gather with each other, even painters. Yes, Painting, writing, all of these things are usually solo tasks. But uh, you find each other somehow to share your experiences um, and to you have to share them, right? If you're an artist, you have to share your work. So you, you find people to share it with and that kind of builds your community. But, um, but the work itself can be, can be done alone. But, um, but if we talk about larger group of creatives and especially what I observe with entrepreneurs is there they struggle more with finding peers, colleagues, and and people to share knowledge with. And uh, something like entrepreneurship, or um, I can't think of any other design, uh, creative work right now, but uh, but entrepreneurs especially that I know struggle to find peers. So it depends what you're doing. Um, entrepreneurs have a tendency of of kind of grinding on their own and when they do gather together with other entrepreneurs or other businesses uh, business owners people in businesses they tend to go in with the mindset of selling their business right because they don't have time to waste all they're thinking about is getting their business forward moving their business forward so their networking process is a lot more around like can I somehow get into a mutually beneficial relationship with this person but it's not about talking about feelings it's not about talking about you know do you have any tips and tricks about this there are some entrepreneur communities uh, or creative communities besides artists who do this but I would say they struggle way more to find each other all right well let's kind of zoom in on something that I already know about your past experience and even your current affairs if you could say <laughs> so you're a community manager for co-ventures and if I'm correct that Co-Ventures is kind of this Finnish organization pioneering like an entrepreneur in residence type model. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could kind of talk about like some of the tools or methodologies that you use in that type of community to build things and then kind of best match uh, tools and resources with the, the right amount of people. And I guess are the, the people that need it the most or uh, I guess the, the attractive clients and stuff like that. Yeah. And then we'll try to kind of maybe bridge that to the creative community and uh, what's missing there today. Yeah, definitely. And I'll come back to that because I think I'm, I missed a, a point about the, the creatives as well. But uh, to answer about uh, entrepreneur community or co-ventures community specifically. So I'm their community manager right now. And um, I would say working with entrepreneurs who are mostly uh, in between gigs, let's put it that way, um, or they're building their own consulting business or something more solopreneur type business. Um, so they were, a lot of them were craving to find others, peers, people to celebrate with, people to, you know, hang out with, people to have after work with, people to share ideas with, uh, have a, you know, late night call with to talk about some new idea. Entrepreneurs are very, you know, dynamic and energetic people who want to share things. So, um, when you've had your own company that you founded, you have your employees to talk with, but then when you're out of that gig if you're in between exits for example or you decided to do a solopreneur gig then who are you going to celebrate with co-ventures is kind of solving that problem for them by bringing them together they can continue to do and grow the business that they're wanting to do at the moment or whatever business is even they're trying to do but they can have a, a, a place to come to where they can share ideas share knowledge uh, learn new things from each other work together and uh, so co-ventures is kind of that. Let's go further with that. Like, mm -hmm. 
on a day-to-day -day level, what does that look like beyond the after-work drinks and stuff like how do they actually bring that toward the product that they're developing or maybe the service that they're implementing? Is it through a Slack channel or is there more innovative things that you guys come up with over there that you can tell us on screen? <laughs> yeah. So, of course, we have a Slack channel where we share most, most of everything. It's the easiest way to kind of share a communication channel. But um, I, I would say it's a mixture of things. So there's one, one side of it, which is about taking care of people, which is what I think I'm naturally good at, making sure that understanding what are people's needs and how can we solve those needs. So that's kind of the, the service that, that we're giving. Um, and then um, it's also about like understanding how do, what do each entrepreneur need? So there's like the group need and then there's each entrepreneur's needs. So some of them, it might be something like uh, they want uh, help with developing their, their offering or you know how to they, how their pitch, for example and we can bring together entrepreneurs to help them. So it's not just us who are serving them, but the, the people within the community help each other. And that's what a community is. If it was just us providing a service, then we would just be a service provider. Now, this is another interesting kind of uh, maybe observation, but I guess there's an English saying that's like, some people walk so others can run, something to that effect. But basically, like, CoVentures is standing on the shoulders of giants. And uh, I'll back up and try to say this, like, in Helsinki, we've kind of noticed a shift uh, in maybe the early thousands with this slush model. So it brought this kind of community startup uh, to like an international audience beyond the Nordics, within the Nordics. Um, and now, you know, you kind of look at other community movements. And the most other one for the creatives you could think of is the techno scene in Helsinki. Mm -hmm. So, of course, now that the fact that this startup community has matured enough that there's actually something that could be sold on top of it, like that there's service providers, it makes sense that there's already like an existing audience. But now when you think of creatives beyond just kind of what they do in their free activities, like techno rave underneath the bridge or going to Anivali or the complex like Silton, uh, how do you reach them? So I think what is the one thing for maybe an entrepreneurial minded person to kind of reach out to this creative that they don't understand that life yet beyond what they see, be, you know, sharing a drink or something. So yeah, maybe you could utilize like some of the tools you've already used and your past job position, uh, maybe talk about your process on how you would approach them. I'm not sure I understood the question, but so you're asking how are people, how are we, how are entrepreneurs connecting to creatives or innovative people? Yeah, sorry, I can, we can pause it here. Like <laughs> in some ways it's like, I'll, I'll rephrase it really yeah. easy. Okay. Nowadays there's kind of like a really mature startup community in Helsinki. But we can't say that there's maybe a really mature creative and culture industry that's connected. So the startup community in Helsinki, there's a lot of avenues for support. Like mm -hmm. there's easy network events for this X, Y, Z. Yeah. However, for creatives, you know, maybe we see Ping Helsinki um, where there's kind of a, a group of people that are Instagram influencers and they get together and uh, they share best practices or the designers are over at Order and Mimo or there's another thing that's very targeted to a specific niche. How do you think that you could catalyze a movement where creatives would start connecting and uniting with each other? And what mm -hmm. tools would you utilize in the beginning to kind of attract them or outreach to them to then to get to the point where it kind of matches the startup community that we're seeing in Helsinki? Got it. Yeah. So I think there's a few steps to start with. The first one is start talking to those creatives, understand what what do they care about? What are their values? What are they concerned with? What are some of the challenges they face? Really get to know that group of people that you want to be serving and helping. And once you get to know them really well, then you can, of course, you already have the people you've spoken to, but you can start to develop an offering for them. And the community is the offering, right? But you start to build a community, a model that would serve them best based on what they've given you as information. Um, the same way you would build any product or service. And then once you have that kind of first initial model that you think might help them, it can be like a very simple one at the beginning, maybe serving even a niche group of people within the creative uh, group of people. And then then see how they resonate with it. Do, are they interested in joining? Are they, are they jumping in? Are they emailing you uh, asking, can I join? Are, and then also simultaneously uh, to 
send a message out that this is what we're doing and test it, see if it resonates. So using marketing or just regular communication channels of, hey, we're building this type of community. Does it resonate? Are people interested in joining? But it has to come first from those conversations with, with the creatives themselves to understand what do they care about? What are some of the challenges they face? And then from there, build, build up the community idea. Then, then usually people are attracted to, to what you're doing. They, they hear through the grapevine, they hear from their friends, and they want to join. But it, you have to be very consistent on what, is the value, what are the values that we believe in, what are we trying to aim for here, and have like very specific uh, reasons of being uh, for the community. If you don't have reasons of being uh, or any value proposition for the community members, they will join at the beginning, maybe off of the idea that you've pitched them, but they will eventually drop out because they don't, it's not worth their time. Yeah, it's kind of hard with community-based movements because you kind of want to listen to your audience and kind of develop it as people, as content, and kind of really cater to their needs. At the same time, they really kind of need a structure to begin with to understand where you're going. So another thing that I've kind of noticed in terms of community building uh, from the New Nordic Way angle is that we created this kind of WhatsApp. So maybe it's a landing page that takes you to join this conversation. Uh, but one of the biggest challenges that we face is kind of keeping them engaged. And I think one of the reasons behind that, of course, is that we haven't met them in real life. Have you ever had any uh, like past examples of where you've managed to be part of like this digital community that you've never met any of them in real life, but you've kind of been uh, fully fledged and like kind of almost believing that they're your online friends? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great uh, kind of, that's a great uh, example because uh, I had my own business uh, starting in 2018, which was based in Canada. And it was a fitness studio uh, with my co-founder who was there locally. And um, it started right before the pandemic. We opened the studio, I think it was 2019. And by 2020, we were in full fledged pandemic. So not the best time to have a fitness studio um, it was a roller coaster ride, not to say the least. And uh, we had to pivot really quickly to a digital platform. And when we pivoted to a digital platform, then everybody was online. The community was online entirely. And uh, well, it did become more easier for me to manage because I was in Finland the entire time. So having people online is much easier for me to 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 manage. But at the same time, uh, it was a new challenge to build a community of people that have never met. And how do you get them to trust each other, to feel, you know, value out of the community, to feel like they uh, want to log in, they want to, you know, exercise together on live video streams or uh, watch our videos and comment on them. So all of that was really, really a new challenge for me, but uh, but possible, absolutely possible to do. Yeah, and then I have to say that this is kind of a, uh interesting angle from your personal background as well as like I think you're so grounded in culture what it means in a lot of different contexts where I think for us it's still like a very thing that's elusive term so like when you hear culture tied to the creative industries it's like what the hell does that mean like culture in some ways of course is just like the average amount of customs that a certain people share in a certain location so and it kind of organically happens but now that you're moving towards communities that you create, you have to manufacture these feelings, these values. Mm -hmm. So how do you think, like, for what the cultures that already exist today in the Nordics, some of them can be feeling a little bit closed or rigid to an outsider are then celebrated from the point of view of an insider, like, oh, this is, like, the best way and it's the most efficient and it works for us. Um, how do you see kind of the creative and culture industries leading the change and repainting this kind of social fabric of society? Oh, I love this question because I'm so interested in culture and, and how it develops. Um, so there are two things. Like in a, in a company, to build the culture, it comes from the people. I think this is a very basic, a basic statement. But I think the thing that is often undermined specifically in Finland is um, the effect that leaders have on culture. I think we like to think, especially new companies, young companies like to think that they're like, horizontal and that there is no um, there's no hierarchy you can talk to anyone anytime and you know they'll they like to say that you can walk into my office or call me at any time so there's no hierarchy it's just not true there 
whoever, there's always somebody within the community that people turn to, to look at, to see what they're going to do next, to mimic or to watch as an example, always, whether they're in a leadership position or just someone in a sports team that people admire. Um, so you have to be conscious of that. That shapes culture. And if you're not conscious of it, you're going to shape the culture in a way that you didn't uh, do purposefully. So the first thing is, if you're trying to change a culture or build a culture, a specific type of culture within a company, you need to talk to the leadership and understand, first of all, make them understand the effect they're going to have on the culture, whether they like it or not, um, how they can affect it in a way that they want to affect it, to, to move the culture in a direction that they want it to. And it starts with them. And then how do they communicate the, what they, their goals as what kind of culture they want to build? How do they communicate that effectively to the, to their employees or their team? So that's one in a in a company setting. I think that's how how you have so, to understand. So leadership, whether it's kind of organic or not, yeah, informal, and then also communication. So then now maybe you could take it on those free time activities. You know, one other thing I find as a bottleneck, it's like you sometimes always feel like after you're 25 and you've had your personal discovery years, it's like that you really know yourself. At the same time, I don't think I could throw darts on the wall to my three values that truly define me. You know, it's like <clears throat> only then do I see it online or happening right before my eyes is that I'm like, hey, that, that's something I'd want to be a part of. But, yeah, shaping a community, like, of course, it's always nice to have a North Star, these values that you could put there on a website for people to easily understand. It's just not that easy. Um, but, yeah, so this question I kind of comes down to is like, what three values do you think defined you the most? I was just about to say that um, when it comes to defining, I don't think most people know how to define their, their own values. I would say people would give maybe throw out some words here and there, and I can throw some at you as well. But um, I don't think that's how you build the, cul uh, the culture or communicate it either by using just taglines or words. I think a lot of companies still use that and try to use that too. And it can work sometimes, but I personally wouldn't use that approach. I think the values come out from how people respond to certain things. So if you see that your employees or your team or your community members respond negatively to a certain thing, you understand that their, val their values are not aligned with this one thing. So you have to note that down, understand, okay, this isn't aligned with their values. That's more important than thinking like, uh, is, uh, you know, being, um, being honest. Anyone will say, yes, that's a value of mine. Is being uh, tr transparent. Yes, anyone would say, yes, that's a value of mine. Is being like loyal. And so you can throw these words at people. People will say, yes, those are mine. <laughs> hey, you, you know what I would say is another interesting concept that you brought up too is this kind of like the Zuckerberg crew that was like, go fast and break things. So when you're kind of attacking products and services that are a little bit further away from humans, of course, humans are the ones that are interacting with them. Um, basically, it, it's not it's not like it's horrible if they go fast and break things because it's like the emotion's a bit removed. But if you're very experimental in terms of how you kind of uh, approach that interface with people, and you're kind of like pushing the boundaries of uh, culture, it's like one bad thing could be held against you for the rest. Remember, ma like imagine a first impression with somebody. Um, you know, it's like yeah. within that first impression, you're almost willing to write them off. So it's very hard to be these kind of innovators in culture unless it's like these, uh, what you hear in change, man change management terms. Like they come in and they know it's going to be a turnaround type transformation and um, it's going to flip everything on its head. Uh, does any other examples come up to you about the innovative culture? Yeah, well, it, that's really interesting. Some people are very principled, and if you do them wrong once, they'll cut you out. But I wouldn't say that's everyone. I would say most people are quite flexible and understand, you know, we're all human beings. Um, so I don't know if, if making mistakes and going fast and breaking things is always a bad thing. I personally like that. I like testing out and hitting the wall and realizing, okay, not that direction, let's pivot. That's my approach to things. Um, and like I was saying earlier about, you know, understanding values, making mistakes is going to tell you so much about the values of your team. So 
as a leader, you shouldn't shy away. You're going to make mistakes anyway. But as a leader, you shouldn't shy away from making mistakes and saying something wrong, doing something wrong, because people are going to let you know by their response that that's not how we want things to go. So it's it use that information to build your culture and um, and do better next time. Right. Yeah, and to contextualize this conversation just a little bit more, you know that uh, Finland's kind of going through a new rebirth in terms of attracting international talent, and now they're kind of have that second leg opportunity, which is actually integrating it successfully. So at New Nordic Way, how do you think we could best kind of include this kind of more diverse perspective, not only in terms of thoughts, but also uh, diverse people? Um, you know, what is the right way forward? Because of course, it's nice and easy to kind of preach online that we're this and we're that, but I really like to be uh, inclusive and diverse in practice. You know, I'm coming from the United States. When I look back at my family album, it's full of a lot of different cultures and experiences. Um, so I don't want to be this kind of person in theory. Um, but yeah, how can we kind of like make steps in the right direction today? What's your best next step? Yeah, well, you know, we have a similar background because we're both from East Coast, nor North America. So we kind of, we we grew up in diverse spaces. Um, so coming here is a shock, right? With the homogene. Homogeneous. <laughs> Homogeneous. Yeah. Um, but um, how to move forward in building uh, or into integrating diversity naturally or organically into your community is by building a community that is attractive to diverse people. So when you think about the, the type of community that you want to build, you have to think about when are people coming together? What hours of the day is it uh, available to everyone to meet at that time of day? Are we doing activities that are attractive and interesting to diverse people? Or are we just playing video games and drinking beer? Which is not a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But it might just interest a certain um, type of person, right? And it excludes a bunch of others who can't meet on a Tuesday night to play video games and drink beer somewhere. Yeah. So start so small and be conscious. Be conscious of how you are structuring the community. And this is this applies to any type of community. It can be, a, you know, a casual community of friends. It can be um, it can be a work community. It can be a, a nonprofit organization, community, whatever type of community, the same thing applies. If you want to attract diversity, you have to make it accessible to and interesting to diverse people. What are you actually doing? If, if you're only attracting a certain type of person, it's a, it tells you that, well, for some reason, we're not interesting to X, Y, Z. Well, this uh, opens up another conversation <laughs> for another day. And I think it's like, it's always a challenge for the human experience to befriend your opposite yeah you know especially if you cl close your eyes and you kind of feel like that soul is pretty familiar to you um but yeah getting there is always kind of a tumultuous journey um but to kind of finish up today's conversation what's kind of one inspirational quote that you could leave us with that's maybe related to community building that you've come across it could be a book an insight or just something off the cuff yeah a quote oh i didn't think of I'm quite bad with quotes, but... Okay, Amir could say you know. <laughs> um, Yeah, well, the culture quote, I think I've mentioned it to you, is, is a book that I think anyone interested in building culture and communities is it should should have a read, and it's a, quite a short book, so definitely that. Um, but I would say that if there's anything to understand about communities is that it's not, um, it's not just about having fun, even if it's a, on weekends fun sports team type of thing it's not it can't just be about having fun because these days people don't have time just for that to take away from their families just to have fun it can be part of it the other one is make it valuable give value to people all right yeah great uh book reference i'll have to look into that i'll add that on my bookshelf so another thing i would like to ask you is this so for community building sometimes the main primary focus is uh, fostering this element that you want to be a part of and that you're so focused on for New Nordic Way, promoting entrepreneurship and creativity. But how can we make it economically viable and kind of sustained thing to offer people over the course of time? You know, there's going to have to be that core team that glues it all together and keeps it running. 
Yeah, you say something. You said something really important there. There has to be the core team or people who are, you know, keeping the flame alive because community doesn't happen um, that easily and it doesn't stay alive that easily. Sometimes it does, but it, usually they're not growing communities or working communities. So you need the core team, and that of course costs money. So how do you uh, how do you keep that or economically viable, as you said? So there's a few ways that people do it. Um, one of them is, of course, that there's a fee for the community that has to be reasonable, that people are willing to pay to join. That's one way. That's very easy. The other way is to offer services that are uh, like add-ons. When you're part of this community, maybe the base of it is, you know, a nonprofit or you work together um, on a more casual setting. But anything beyond, any service beyond that community is an add-on that you would you would pay for. So there are things that, of course, people are working here. So you need to, you need to, and working for you to offer you a service, but it has to be a service that is valuable to the people that you're giving, giving it to or, or offering it to. And that's all comes down to the same thing I was saying earlier. Talk to your community members, get from them what they want. And so if you offer them what they want, they will give you a return. And there are a bunch of models. There are so many different models. It can be, you know, sponsors. It can be uh, partnerships. It can be uh, investors. There are so many different ways that you can make it um, economically viable and sustainable. But um, choose the one that resonates with your community members and makes them want to be there with you. Yeah, and I think for New Nordic, it would be great if we could keep it free for the user. So for that individual and somehow come up with this partnership model that uh, engages like city partners as well as corporate partners um, that would be interested in having access to great talent and the upskilling of their workforce that can create more taxes, of course, in a social welfare community that is very essential. Um, So thank you, Merka, and uh, look forward to our next conversation. Let's see what the next episode brings.